Have you heard of a 19th century politician named William L. Marcy? Does that ring any bells? No? He doesn't have a hip Broadway musical written about his life like Alexander Hamilton does, so you might not have heard of him. It's OK. You definitely have heard of this one thing that he said in 1832, and it absolutely affects your life. He was senator from New York. He was a lawyer. He was governor of New York. Eventually, he became secretary of war and secretary of state. He was kind of a big deal. In fact, there he is on the $1,000 bill. Did y'all know we have a $1,000 bill? No. Me either, to tell you the truth. During debate on the Senate floor in 1832 over President Andrew Jackson's unpopular and controversial secret recess appointment of Martin Van Buren as minister to Great Britain, Marcy said, to the victor belong the spoils of the enemy. To the victor belongs the spoils of the enemy. In this case, Andrew Jackson was the victor. The spoils of office was the minister to Great Britain post. And Henry Clay, then senator and former secretary of state, was the enemy. Martin Van Buren, incidentally, is known to history as the little magician. He's widely credited as having started America's party system, as we now know it. Marcy was loyal to Martin Van Buren. He was a part of his Albany Regency. He was also loyal to Andrew Jackson, the Democratic Party. My argument is that to the victor belongs the spoils of the enemy defines American politics today. And that it's a problem. I'm going to ask you to join with me in thinking critically about what Marcy's aphorism does to us and our politics. Critical theorists like Louis Althusser write about Americans as subjects, as always already subjects. He says that we are positioned by ideology and the state to be fractured, obedient, divided against our best interests. I don't think that we have to be always already subjects. I'm hoping for better. The reason why I think that we can do better is because we're always learning how to think about ourselves, our government, and our relationships to one another. We learn this from an early age. For example, my three-year-old daughter's daycare. The teachers there try to promote good behavior by calling all of the kids in the class friends. They say things like, friends don't push. Friends share. Friends don't poke. Friends play together, and it works. It works in the daycare, and it works with my daughter in other places. For example, last weekend, we were on our way to the park, driving the car, and I said to her, I hope that there are some kids there at the park for you to play with. And she said from the back seat, no! Which is weird, right? So I said, you don't want to play with kids in the park? And she said, no, play with kids. Play with friends. It's OK, you can laugh. It's funny. <laughs> I laughed. Sure enough, when we got to the park, she saw some kids playing, yelled out friends, and took off running. They were always already friends for her. She didn't know those kids. Friends don't push. Friends share. Friends don't poke. Friends play. So let's go back to Marcy's aphorism. What does it do to us and our politics to think of those who are entrusted with great political power as victors, as if they have won a football game or a war? On the one hand, it trivializes politics, because politics is not sports. On the other hand, it trivializes war. Politics is not war. And in both accounts, it treats us as either fans, cheering and booing for the home team, fanatics, or it treats us as loyal and obedient soldiers, following the party line. 
neither of which is very good for citizenship. What does it do to us, to our politics, to think of the obligations of office as spoils? The dictionary defines spoils as ill-gotten gains, which makes me think of plunder, plundering treasure. Politicians are pirates raiding the ship of state. I'm not sure if it's really that bad, but it's pretty bad. And in any case, it's corrupt. Thinking of the obligations of office as spoils is a sure sign of corruption in government. What does it do to us? What does it do to our politics when we think of those who have differing political policy preferences from us as enemies? Enemies are evil. Enemies cannot be trusted. Enemies are irrational. Because if they were rational, they would think like we do. Since they don't, they are clearly others. We don't negotiate with evil, irrational, untrustworthy others. That wouldn't be prudent. And so we don't. When we think of people who have different policy preferences from us as evil, we treat them as enemies first and Americans second. Ultimately, I think that Marcy's aphorism treats us as partisans and not citizens. So what's wrong with that? Partisans don't trust. Partisans are corrupt. Partisans are fanatics. Partisans don't solve problems. Qui bono? Do you know that Latin term? It's an old Roman legal term. It means who profits, right? If you want to solve the crime, figure out who stands to gain the most. So in this case, qui bono, who profits? Political party profits. Who loses? The rest of us. I'm not asking for us to be as innocent as three-year-olds, treat each other as always already friends. But wouldn't the world be a better place if we did? Instead, I'm asking for us to treat each other as always already citizens, instead of always already partisans. But that means we have to actually be citizens. So what does that mean? Aristotle thought that a citizen is an officer of the government, not just a mere member of a political community. So you might be wondering, what is your office? You might also be wondering, where is your office? Perhaps someone forgot to give you the key. The founding fathers thought that the office of government is to be a watchdog over the government. They thought that we ought to investigate facts, that we must search into causes, and that we should judge the actions of government based on the standards of our own liberty and our happiness. As Marcy and his little band of partisans took over American politics between 1824 and 1828, inventing the party system, they took away a little bit of our watchdog function. As life got more complicated in the 20th century, we gave up even more of our watchdog power to the mass media, who have promised to hold the government and political parties in check to guard our liberty and our happiness. And do they? Do the mass media, politicians, political parties, do they guard our liberty and our happiness for us? I think they might like to. I really do, particularly the journalists, who I think go in their profession with great uh, goals. But unfortunately, they don't, as it stands now. Political parties care about the interests of political parties. They claim the spoils of office. And media are a business, and increasingly more partisan themselves, because it's good for business. For example, 66% of Facebook users get their news primarily from their Facebook news feed. 
We all know that the Facebook algorithm skews what we see in order to keep us on the site longer. We spend an average of 50 minutes a day on Facebook today. The longer we stay on Facebook, the more advertising they can sell. So what does it do to our politics? What does it do to our news for the algorithm to skew our news? I'm obsessed with this great app from the Wall Street Journal. They have created a way for us to see how the algorithm shows you the news if the algorithm thinks that you're a liberal or a conservative. Notice this example from this weekend. The first two stories use the word humiliate. Very polarizing. We talk about enemies in terms of humiliating them, not fellow citizens. Notice the second example. The CIA director says something. Liberals spin it one way to support their cause. Conservatives spin it another to support theirs. Notice the next example. ISIS is either on the run in Fallujah or our government is doing absolutely nothing to stop them. And finally, I guarantee you that the USA Today did not literally smack Donald Trump upside the head. All of these examples are the news presented to us in our most partisan, most polarizing form. This is news that treats us as partisans first and citizens second. So what's wrong with that? We don't solve political problems because we're too partisan. Why would you negotiate and find common ground with enemies? You wouldn't. This nation is further apart politically than we have ever been before. The average Democrat, average Democrat, is more liberal than 93% of Republicans. The average Republican is more conservative than 94% of Democrats. There is no common ground. We can't solve political problems in this country because we can't figure out what unites us, where we meet in the middle. What's worse, 45% of Republicans think that democratic policies are a threat to the nation. 41% of Democrats think the same thing about Republican policies. A threat to the nation. Isn't that a little silly? I mean, a little hyped up and overblown. Who threatens the nation? Enemies. Enemies threaten the nation. Qui bono? Who profits? So hopefully I have encouraged you to think of yourself as a citizen and not a partisan. You might be asking, how can I do that? What can I do? I have some tips. The first one is to fact check. Do that thing that the founding fathers thought we ought to do. Be a watchdog over the government. Investigate facts. Look into causes. Judge the actions of government, the media, politicians, based on the standards of your liberty and your happiness. Second, read fact check news sources. Despite what I just showed you about the partisanship in the press, there are objective, reliable fact-check news sources. In particular, I recommend factcheck.org, PolitiFact, or Snopes. Read multiple news sources. No one news source can give you the information that you need to actually judge accurately. Talk to people who are not like you. And this is hard, really hard. When people say thing that, things that you don't like in your Facebook news feed, don't hide them from your feet. But don't yell at them either, right? Instead, talk to them. Ask them why they think what they think. Ask them for evidence. Talk, listen, think. Treat one another as citizens first and partisans second. And finally, attend meetings or clubs or classes Go out into your community and talk to people who are not like you. Robert Putnam writes about the difference between bridging and bonding social capital in his book, Bowling Alone. Bonding social capital is between you and people like you, people on your Facebook feed, in your phone, people you have a relationship with. Bridging social capital is between you and people who are not in your social circle, people not already in your phone, on your Facebook. It turns out that it's the bridging social capital that's most important. 
the people that we meet by going to a book club or going to a block party, by taking a class, attending a meeting. The more people we have bridging social capital with, the more trust we have for society, the less polarization there is. Putnam argues that this generation has less bridging social capital than previous generations, and that it's a problem. Vote, but don't just vote for a party. Vote for a person. And vote for a person who you think is going to best represent your views, who will best protect your liberty and happiness. And don't just vote for the incumbent. Do you know that the word incumbent means to lay down? To lay down in office? Why would we want anyone to lay down in office? We don't. And yet we vote the incumbent into power 90% of the time. Perhaps if we start to think of ourselves as citizens instead of partisans, then politicians will also learn that to the victor belongs the spoils of the enemy isn't the right way to think about politics. Perhaps they can learn that to those entrusted with great responsibility belongs the obligation to work for the common good. It isn't quite as poetic or pithy, but it also isn't as partisan. You might be interested to know that Marcy's aphorism did not persuade Henry Clay or the Senate to approve Van Buren's recess appointment. Van Buren was fine, though. He became vice president later that year and president four years later. Marcy went on to the governorship in New York. He became secretary of war and secretary of state. And in 1878, as a thank you for his work to start the spoils system in American politics, his face was put on the $1,000 bill. He stayed there until 1907, when he was replaced by another of America's greatest partisans, Alexander Hamilton.